Hello, everyone. Good morning. Happy Saturday. Sorry, I'm a little bit late, but it's okay. Better than nothing. Okay, so thank you, thank you, and welcome to another Saturday of live Q and A for the Eat to Focus group. So um, I'm going to continue what I've been doing since the last week. So you can comment below if you have any question. Hi everyone for joining. So okay, um, so I'm gonna get started. So every Saturday I've been doing this for a couple months now. So I'll basically use this opportunity to answer some of the questions that you have in the in the Facebook group or on um, on Instagram. So I usually go over the questions that you have and the reason why I started this is be because a lot of times I feel like I cannot answer your question properly when you post it on Facebook so that's like oh yeah let me just do this and that way I can answer a lot of questions and I'm sure like some of the question that is posted applies to many people as well so it's just a more efficient way for me to answer and then um, so I saw that this week a lot of people actually posted questions when we ask what kind of question you're interested in. So I'm, I try to answer as many questions as possible. If not, you can put it on the comment under and I'll try to answer next week. Or if you're interested in getting a free consultation with me, you can also schedule that as well. Then you can actually talk to me one on one and then we can go over your situation, see how I can help you with that. Okay. All right, welcome everyone. So we're just getting started. So let me just put my little um, thingy and I think I, I got a lot of questions today this week, but I want to quickly start with this one question. I think I, I kind of see this question a lot. So, so my background is a pediatric dietitian. So I work with um, basically a lot of children between newborn, so premature, brand new NICU babies, all the way to even grown up young adults who have very special, um, special or rare disease or childhood disease. So that's kind of my background and my specialty. And I've been doing that for like last 20 something years. So I've seen it all and everything. So I want to start the first question about talking diet because like I said, I saw a lot of these and people often I think one of the reasons why people follow me or join this group is they want to learn more about eating, how to eat, what to eat, what not to eat for ADHD. So I saw that many, many people often start out with like a clean diet. So a clean diet basically meaning that you eliminate as much processed food as possible, any kind of food colorings, preservative additives. That's, that's the diet that most people think, oh yeah, that's the ADHD diet. So if I want to try the ADHD diet. Let's remove all those things. Some most people will see significant improvement just by removing those processed foods that have a lot of additives and stuff. Sometimes saying that, oh yeah, we we'll the diet, we cut out this, 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 and that, and it's still I don't see any improvement. So then the question is, is that what else? that is left in the diet right now that is still causing some of the symptoms. So um, one of the things that is I try to avoid like putting a label on the kid and say they have ADHD. I prefer the term ADHD symptoms. I think I might have mentioned it last time. But um, it's more of the symptoms. The symptoms is just basically telling us that something inside the body needs some attention. So the thing is, um, in my book, Eat to Focus, I, I actually have a whole protocol as to how to, to do this whole ADHD and Eat to Focus lifestyle that is not focused all on just what to eat and what not to eat. It's, it's a way of eating where it is very personalized and I teach you how to do that. The, one of the first steps in the Eat to Focus protocol, the first and very um, significant steps is actually the the elimination clean start diet. So the elimination clean start diet is not just any elimination or any clean diet that you just remove all the processed food, all the food colorings and preservative, all those things 
that we know affects the brain chemicals and hormones in the body. Only part of it. The other part that a lot of people is missing, and also the reason why you change your child's diet, clean it up, and still not seeing changes, the hidden food sensitivity and intolerance part of it. People often think that, oh yeah, like I'll change the diet, but they don't realize that kids with ADHD and even a lot of kids with um, uh, what you call mental illness and things like that do tend to have more food sensitivity or intolerance. Like, okay, you'll hear me use all those words interchangeably, but I'm not going to use the word allergy because I get a lot of parents ask me, oh, do you think my child has allergy? Can we do allergy testing? I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I have another video that talks about food allergies, sensitivity, and all those things. But in kids with ADHD, what we see is there's a lot of food intolerances or sensitivity. And when I use the word intolerances and sensitivity, I'm not talking about food allergy. Because allergy is anything that is IgE related or IgE mediated. These are the true real allergy where you eat something and your body reacts with an immune response. But when I'm talking about sensitivity, it's like something that is more of a chemical irritation or food that hurts the stomach for any other reason that does not trigger an allergic reaction. And that's the reason why when you do all this blood tests and skin tests and everything comes back negative is because there is limitation of those tests and those tests only um, look for IgE mediated reaction. It doesn't look for sensitivity. It's kind of like if you have problem breaking down certain food, those kind of things is not going to show up. The only way to identify those kind of sensitivity and, and intolerances is to food, do a very detailed food journal for over a week, writing down everything that your child eats or for yourself. You write down everything that you eat and then monitor the symptoms that happens after. And the other tricky part with that is that um, with sensitivities and intolerances, some of the symptoms doesn't show up right away like a food allergy. Most food allergy, you you react right away within like a couple minutes or something an hour. But with a lot of the sensitivities and the intolerances, some of the symptoms might not even appear like two, three days later. So that's why it's really hard to identify. And also the other thing that you also have to understand is unlike um, food reaction or uh, allergic reaction, which is a like I said, IgE mediated, that means that the body actually has an immune response to it. So you actually see physical manifestation of those reactions. But with sensitivity and intolerance, sometimes it's just behavior that you see. You might not even see any physical signs like skin rash and things like that. So you just have to be very careful and monitor what kind of change you notice in your child. So um, that's the part that I want to talk about um, diet change and the reason why you might not see any change in um, when you change your diet but otherwise if you do the diet well and correctly you should be able to see some change and in the in the eat to focus protocol the the diet that I have recommend is a very fundamental elimination diet where most of the very common food allergens are removed from the diet and you keep your child or yourself on it for at least a month, two months, sometimes three months until most of the symptoms improve significantly. And then you're going to do the reintroduction phase. That's why a lot of people think, oh my God, the diet is so hard to follow. Like there's so many things I cannot have. The diet is not meant to be for a lifetime. It is a healing diet where you eliminate all the potential food that is causing or triggering some of the symptoms. You remove those foods, then it allows your body to heal. It's kind of like someone, if you constantly cut yourself or picking at your wound, it'll never heal, right? So you just stop all that insult and leave it alone, and then your body will start feeling better. Things will start normalized on its own. After that happens, then you can start introducing some of the food back, and you'll notice that 
you'll be able to eat more food and have a lot less symptoms. So that's kind of um, the idea of the elimination clean start diet. So yeah, that's something to look into if especially you have tried clean out the diet and you're still having like symptoms that are not, not going away or not improving. Okay, so here, okay, I don't know why I picked this. Mm, hold on. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I think this is a post where we ask like what kind of questions you have about natural alternative ADHD treatments. So let's see. So this person, I'm not gonna read names because these are all from the book. But okay, I don't really try. I don't really want to take Western medicine if I can avoid it. But I'm not sure where to start to naturally treat. Any recommendation? I'm 30 and my daughter is going to be 12 in two weeks. And we both have it. And I assume that it is the ADHD. So um, again, we're going to start with the diet because to me, diet or the food is like the fuel for the body, right? You know how like when you're at work and then you, you come in to work on Monday and then you try to turn on the computer and then you didn't turn on, and then you call the support people, the IT people, and first thing they probably ask you is, did you plug in the computer? Because maybe over a weekend, the housekeeper comes in and plug everything because they need to vacuum the floor or wax the floor. So to me, that's what nutrition is. Nutrition is the fuel for your body and for your brain. So that's the reason why I often focus on like trying to make sure that you're feeding the body and the brain first because if you don't have that source of energy or the nutrition in the brain's not gonna, gonna be able to function normally it's just like when you don't eat or when you don't don't have enough to eat you feel tired right so if your body is tired your brain is just as tired as well because your brain is connected to everything so diet is always the first so i mentioned about the elimination and elimination clean start diet and the next step is really focusing on what's the right kind of food to feed the human body part of it is to also understand how the adhd brain works right because we know that one of the cause of the adhd uh, one of the potential difference of the adhd brain is that it is a little bit behind and smaller and process certain nutrients differently so also focusing on what's the human body needs. So basic human body needs is carbohydrate, protein, fats, and all the micronutrients like the vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants. So those are the basic nutrients that our body as a human needs. And then we look at the food, right? And then look at what kind of food we're eating because we might think that we're eating food, but then what's exactly in the food that we're eating? Because the food carries all that nutrients, the, the carbohydrate, protein, and fats. But then all of those things have different reaction to the food because we often think that we often think food in terms of calories, but it is not. Calories is a made up term. So your body doesn't care about calories. What your body cares is the, the nutrients, both macro and, nutri and micronutrients. So the carbohydrate, protein, and fats. When you eat food that have carbohydrate, your body have a different reaction. When you eat protein, there's a different reaction to it. When you eat fats, something different happens. So all the nutrients are different. So we need to understand that all of those carbohydrate, protein, and fats, they're all important, have like their own very specific function in our body and trigger different response. And then rather than thinking that oh, all carbs are bad, is learning that what carbs are good and what is bad or not so good. Uh, everything there's good and bad and, and our body have very specific needs. Like carbs or sugar is considered as a carb, but do we really need it? What does it do to our body, right? And then the other thing, so I mentioned about the ADHD brain kind of behind, smaller, processed food, certain nutrients differently. Then we look at, okay, if the ADHD brain can't process sugar that well, should we still be eating a high carb diet or, or like the, the recommendation that I oh, eat a lot of um, grains, whole grains and carbs and things like that, right? And then the other thing too is, um, and 
The other difference that with the ADHD brain is there might be a lower brain chemicals. Then we have to look at, okay, if the brain chemicals like dopamine, epinephrine, or GAB, GABA, all those are low, how does our body make that? Where does that come from in our body? Because that's something that I think in our society in general, we're not taught to, we're not taught or, or yeah, just taught. We're not taught to look at something deeper. We only look at the surface all the time. It's like, oh, low dopamine, what can we increase it? Instead of trying to find a way to fix it, we need to look deeper behind, right? If your dopamine level is low, then the question is, why is it low? Is it because there's a deficiency in the substrate or the raw material to make dopamine, right? So our body makes dopamine from, I think, tyrosine, phenylalanine, and maybe another one I forgot. But anyway, so all the brain chemicals that we use are in our body comes from somewhere in our body. So if you're constantly eating a high-carb diet that is low in protein, then obviously your body's going to not have enough material to create those brain chemicals. Especially with a lot of the kids that I see, is that all day long they just eat carbs. Breakfast is a big bowl of, of cereal with milk, and then lunch is like peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and then dinner is like chicken nuggets, pizza, and fries, and things like that. So if you look at a diet that looks like that, you're just filling your body with carbs all day long. So if you have carbs, carbohydrate have a few, few um, functions. One is to provide for energy, and then one is is to create a store for future. So basically being converted into fats and then for future use, which the future famine, famine never comes, right? So there's really no need for a high carbohydrate diet, but protein on the other hand, we need protein to build new tissue, brain tissue, muscle tissue, heart tissue, and all those, and bone tissue, all of those things. Also, all the enzymes, all the enzymes, hormones, and brain chemicals in our body are made from amino acid or protein. So if you don't have enough protein, say a child, a young kid, like say toddler age to like four or five years old, who we expect to gain about like 10, 10 to 20, 10 to 15 grams a day, right? So if they have that weight gain, expect them to grow that much every day, but we're not giving them enough protein. So the body's only focus on, oh, let's put the muscle on, let's put the tissue here, put that. So there might not be enough to, to build that extra brain, brain chemicals for the brain to function normally. So that's kind of the things to look at. Like, and that's how me as a pediatric dietitian focus on is, I don't focus just on making sure your child have enough calories. I look at the nutrients, whether your child is growing, because my job is to make sure that your child grow normally, physically, but also to develop the brain, develop all the, the brain functions, skills, learning, ability, and all of those things. So the eating is actually a little bit more complicated than we thought that what, like when you read the magazines or commercials that, oh yeah, just eat this and eat that. It is really not. My approach is very individualized because a lot of my patients that I work with have very, very rare genetic disorder that their genes are different, that their organs function differently. So I have to learn everything about every fun every organ, how it functions, how it works, and the chemical reaction, how it process nutrients. That's how I, I tailor made um, special diets for my patient. And that's how I approach kids and adults with ADHD, I don't just say, oh yeah, you have ADHD, follow this diet. I look at what kind of symptoms you have, like are you having stomach pain? Are you having brain fog? And then I also look at what's happening to you as well, like food is just part of the equation. I don't want to say that everything is about the food, but when you have the right food, your body and your brain function normally, then you're able to cope with all the other stress better. And when you feed your body and your brain with the proper nutrition and nutrients that it needs and can function properly on, and then you still see some of the ADHD symptoms or other behavioral symptoms, then we can say, 
hey, let's look at something else because you get that one part, one area all doubt in, right? Then it might be, okay, the diet is perfect. It's not causing any reaction or anything. Then the next thing is, is there any deficiency that we're missing out? Or is there any other things like psychological side, like what happened to the child before, right? So, um, and actually I saw a question about an adopted kid, which I'll answer later. Um, yeah, so that's where to start with the diet and then supplements. So just, just a quick word, word about supplements. I do recommend supplements, not like, um, like a taboo thing, like other dietitians, they avoid it. I use a lot of supplements because like I said, a lot of the patients that I work with have very special genetic disorder. So regular diet does not work and we need use a lot of supplements. So the purpose of supplements in this case with ADHD is that um, the supplements is more to correct deficiency. It is not like a lot of people think like, oh my God, my child have, can't focus. What supplements can I give? Or my child cannot calm down. It's always hyper. What supplements can I give? So you're using thinking supplements in terms of medication because that's what medications are nowadays is symptom suppressing. So if you have a cough, you take cough medicine. You have heartburn, you take heartburn medicine. But in the, in the whole grand scheme of this ADHD, treatment or natural treatment specifically with the e to focus that I talk about is we use supplements to correct. The first stage of using supplements is really to correct any kind of underlying nutritional deficiency. Like we think that we live in the most developed country in the world, but I've seen so many nutrient deficiency, especially with kids who are overweight. We think that kids who are overweight is eating really well. They're not malnutrition. That's not true. I've seen so many vitamin D deficiency, iron deficiency, and all kinds of deficiency in kids who are overweight. So it is really not actually the food we eat, it's focusing on the nutrients of the food that we eat. Um, so that's the supplement part. And, um, and then after you, you use the supplements to correct any nutritional deficiency, then you can look into other kind of supplements that is more medicinal, more have more medicinal properties like the the herbal supplements most herbal supplements work is because they actually are medicine um sorry. Uncle Salai, if you if you have taken pharma pharmacology class which i have you'll learn that and understand that a lot of the medication that we're using nowadays actually comes from some kind of herbal plant from long time ago. So basically we sometimes think that Eastern medicine is bullshit because they give you some leaves and tweaks and tell you boil some water drink. But a lot of the medication that we're using today actually comes from a plant and pharmaceutical company took that extra out, tweak a few molecules on the on the on that substance, put it in a pill form and then put a pen on it and sell it with so with monopoly for 10 years. Same thing with um, this fish oil. So we talk about fish oil all the time, like if anything related to HD fish oil always comes up. So many years ago, I think it's been 10 years now because that fish oil, um, that fish oil composition or compound is actually available over a counter now. So about 10 years ago or more than that, there's a medication. You had, Actually, they still prescribe it. It's called Lofasa. So the Lofasa is a, actually is back then was a prescribed strength fish oil. But basically, it's just fish oil. But what the pharmaceutical company does is take a regular cheap fish oil, tweak a few molecules, and make it like sound so special. I don't really know how special it is. I read about it a little bit. But they make it super strength. So. Um, if you go on Amazon or online anywhere and find a triple strength fish oil or omega-3 fatty acid, that, that, is, that is the new thing or that was the Lofasa prescribed fish oil, which is treated with um, a few, few tweaking of the molecules, make it super, super high strength so you can get a lot of DHA and EPA in a small pill form. 
but that's how how medication comes into into existence is from all this natural substance this is the reason why i always always warn people about using herbal supplements because even though it says natural there's a lot of poisonous stuff that is natural like poison ivy venom cyanide arsenic all of those are natural but they're poisonous so you need to be very careful when someone says something is natural it doesn't mean that it is safe and especially with any kind of herbal supplements because of the medicinal purpose it can interfere with some of the medications if you're on any medication like especially um, a lot of the heart medication actually comes from plant so um that's supplements and then uh, i'm just gonna go over any okay this is an interesting question someone asked is there any powder or anything that i can use for caffeine for my daughter who's seven years old to put in her water okay this was an interesting question because caffeine to me is more um a substance that will help with the focus and actually i did ask her further what she's trying to to fix because caffeine by itself is more for focus and if you yourself and me included i don't know why i want coffee lately a lot but um caffeine do have some benefit for adhd specifically for the focus part it's not so much to help calm you down for some people it does help calm them down and um and the thing with the coffee is i do have a have a story in that and i talk about it in the book i'm just thinking about if i should talk about it here but um but anyway so caffeine is a natural stimulant adhd medication is also a stimulant except that it is made in a lab and again they somehow tweak things i don't know what exactly they start with um i think adhd medication is like opioid based no it's amphetamine or something like that so it's kind of like on that um, control substance level but i'm not going to dig into that maybe there's a pharmacist here that can explain that in the future for us so but anyway so they're all stimulant and um and like i said the, the stimulant part is more for the focusing and part of that it might also help with calming but might or might not work a lot for the calming is because with the with that extra stimulation of the prefrontal cortex it because the one of the job of the prefrontal cortex actually is for controlling um behaviors and like just overall more control and inhibition so when there's more energy flowing to this area it it might help calm you down but not 100 percent always will happen but definitely for the focus part so the dosage i always forget the numbers but um I think 100 milligrams of caffeine is equivalent to something. I can't remember. Like if someone can find it in my blog or inside my book, I know I wrote it down somewhere. But <laughs> but um, yeah, there's an equivalent. How much caffeine will be equivalent to how much of the the medication? And basically, again, things like Ritalin, Concerta, or the other ones, all those. Things are like stimulants that caffeine can help, but except that you might have to drink a lot of caffeine to get the same dosage if you're taking things like Concerta or Ritalin. But um, yeah, and then the other thing is caffeine is not something that I recommend. Even though I talk about it and I explain how it worked, but um, to me, caffeine is more like a quick fix. Like sometimes I just need caffeine to, to help me focus a little bit so I can go through like um, a task or finish something and you probably know people in and around your circle who drink tons of coffee like i have a boss who actually drink like it's like a slow infusion of diet mountain dew it's just so disgusting he drinks i think two liters a day like slowly infusing it and then this other doctor in my clinic he actually told me he drinks 10 cups of coffee a day like he drinks so much coffee he actually have a keurig right on his desk so he can constantly get a cup of it so he doesn't have to go to a break room or go to starbucks and get keep getting it um yeah so that's what caffeine is for so for kids i don't recommend any kind of caffeine supplement if you want to give your kids some caffeine i'll say just stick with coffee which is the most natural one 
or um, some energy drink. So the most natural sources of caffeine is either coming from coffee or tea, green tea or gu gu gra guarana, which is something that you see mostly in energy drink. I've never actually have any drink like naturally that I can make at home that have guarana in it. But um, so between coffee and ca coffee and green tea, um, coffee have the most caffeine in it. It's like around 100. It depends on the roast and how they do it. Between 65 to 100 milligrams per cup of brew coffee. Compared to green tea, um, actually matcha green tea, not the green tea that you soak the tea bag in the tea, not that. It's the matcha green tea where the green tea leaf is actually ground up into a powder and then mixed into a water or drink and then you drink all the leaves all together. That's the matcha and that's the one that we're talking about. So in that preparation of matcha, there's about, I think, around 20, 15, 20 milligrams of caffeine. But what makes matcha so special is that it also has something called L-theanine, which kind of is an amino acid, but it is more of a more, it does have a more brain um, effects. So the L-theanine, which I saw a lot of posts recently, the last few days, L-theanine is actually a calming, calming um, amino acid. So with the, that's kind of the benefit of matcha green tea is that, so the matcha have the, the caffeine component that wakes you up, keep you focused, but they, but then they also have the calming component of the L-theanine. So for this person asking the question about like adding caffeine to the child's, um, to the child's water, so probably the matcha powder will be a better option. And one way you can do it, like for me, I I usually have a smoothie in the morning for my breakfast, and I alternate making a cashew milk for the base of the smoothie. So my cashew milk base. Sometimes I use cocoa powder in it. Sometimes I use matcha powder in it. So I just alternate it, and that's how I take my matcha powder in my smoothie and you just don't taste it and it tastes delicious okay so that's the caffeine question okay let's see what's the next question okay um i guess i kind of answered that but i'll elaborate more any experiences with l-theanine my child is just tired and grumpy this morning so the l-theanine again like the like question like this is really hard to give a full on answer because it doesn't give me much information. Like, what did your child do? How many hours did your child sleep last night? Was there a big fight yesterday? What other things is your child eating in the diet? So it's hard to say. But like I said, the L-theanine basically is a calming substance. And I think part of it is you have to understand that it is calming. It doesn't make you fall asleep. It's not supposed to make you tired. It just calms you down. So if you have anxiety with a lot of racing thoughts, the L-theanine is going to slow down those thoughts. It is not going to make you sleepy. So I talked about this last week about sleep and um, things that calms you down, like um, magnesium and L-theanine, these things calms you down. It doesn't make you sleepy. Um, what makes you sleepy will be melatonin because melatonin is actually a hormone that your body makes from serotonin at night to get you to fall asleep. But L-theanine shouldn't cause any sleepiness or grumpiness. So if your child is experiencing some of that, you need to look into the other aspect of her lifestyle. Like, did she have a big fight at school or have a big fight with her parents or ate something the night before? Like, we Need to dig deeper we cannot just like make a direct correlation like that it's hard to do it um okay here can someone please advise what helps with adhd mainly behavioral anger and impulsiveness and how long supplements takes to work and interested to know what's best and what works fast school age boys struggling to self-regulate so these are more behavioral things anytime we have like uncontrolled behavior stuff 
And again, your child, when they're acting out, acting angry, acting irritated, it is nothing that he or she does in purpose. It's always something in the brain or in the guts that is causing that. Sometimes could be like trauma response as well. Um, so we we'll have to look at the overall child um, situation overall. Like sometimes I think we over focus on one thing, thinking that oh yeah, it's all about food, or maybe maybe there's a pill or something that we can take. But the thing is, there is pills and supplements that can help calm those symptoms. Like I mentioned, like some of the calming supplements like magnesium, L-theanine, and things like that. But then overall, we have to again look at the whole child as a whole. What's he eating in his diet? What kind of supplement? And then look at the other symptoms to see if any of the symptoms point to any kind of nutritional deficiency. And then also looking at the background, like what kind of environment, home environment is. And then, and also like I mentioned earlier, adopted kids, I've seen a lot of kids who are adopted, they tend to have more trauma, trauma response or um, still dealing with the trauma from living in a in a orphanage and that's actually a few question for but um but what happened is a child if you have adopted a child who's who was um, adopted a child from an orphanage especially is that in a lot of times kids in orphanage are being ignored or neglected because there's so many kids and there's not enough people to give them that hug that touching that, that love that they need. And then a lot of times food is always scarce, especially if you adopt a child who's from a different country or from a developing country. A lot of times we see kids with a lot of developmental um, disorder. And also a lot of Americans adopt children with disability too. So um, I think in those other places, parents will, I guess they don't have the resources. So if the child is born with something weird They'll just give them up in an orphanage. So a lot of those kids start out life with not so ideal situations. So they can be very malnourished or maybe parents trying to hide the pregnancy so they don't have good prenatal care. So we have to look at all of those history of the child, like from the start of the conception, like is the mom having good prenatal care? What condition, medical issue the mom was dealing with during pregnancy? Because any of those things, can affect the development because we don't only just look at the child now like what they're doing now but if there's something that we can also look into all the way back to like previous generation and that's how we look at a lot of kids with special needs we ask about pregnancy history like how much weight the mom gained was the mom having problem during pregnancy did she have gestational diabetes was it controlled was it not do you have preeclampsia during pregnancy? Were you eating the right kind of food? Taking your prenatal vitamins, exposure to cigarette smokes and or chemicals or cat litters and things like that. So we look at all of those, like especially when the child is really young, and also exposure to things like um, what's that common thing? A lead. Like in my whole career, I've only seen one child who have a high lead level. And the reason why is because mom mom is from another country. So she have like all this like super fancy, like antique furniture that is like hundred something years old with lacquer on it. And because no one thinks about that, right? So she let the kids touch all the furniture and go eat on it. Like all her lacquer, lacquer piece, uh, lacquer paint uh, furniture. So the kids have like, a lead level like through the roof like the highest that i've seen and i don't know why the doctor sent them to me because i was like i don't know how to get rid of the, the lead but anyway so that's something to think about is the environment as well right like do you have like live in a place um condos before certain certain years because before i think 1978 lead pipes are allowed and legal, but after that, they're not. So, but there's still some buildings still have lead pipes in them. So all those environmental things to look at and then cigarette exposures. And like I said, if the child's adopted from an orphanage, there's neglect, but then also worse, the orphanage is, right? Maybe they're living on a farm exposed to a lot of um, 
fertilizers, chemicals, and things like that. So there's so many things to look at. So like, okay, basically my point is don't hyper-focus on one thing. Just try to look at the overall, but then always, always dial in the diet because when you have the diet and the nutrition correct, it's like you have the electricity and the power to the whole house, then you can start seeing more of the real symptoms that are surfacing. Then you'll be able to pinpoint the actual causes a lot better. Okay, this one. So this one talks about omega-3 fatty acid. Okay, this is a really long one, but maybe I'll summarize part of it. So I'm starting a process of looking and get my kid some help. He's also exhibiting some behaviors I'm not sure are consistent with ADHD. and was wondering if your children do these things as well. He hates socks and most shoes. He said that they're not comfortable. Went through four pairs of shoes before we found one that he would wear. Socks never feel right. He says that they hurt. I tell him they are soft socks. They're not hurting him. Another example would be if he gets a stuffy nose at night, it's total meltdown because he can't breathe, can't sleep. Makes it worse because now he's also crying. I got something, he got something in his eye recently and just lost it. Full on meltdown for an hour because it hurt. And I'm sure it did, but it's like he can't deal with it. So get some, get, got drops and put one in his eyes and we would have that. Okay, yeah, we can skip most of the rest of it. So basically, this is a child, how old? So this is a child with a lot of sensory issue. So when we see, what we see is in children who have sensory issue, they're super picky with the clothes, like shirt has to be a certain way, like the text. So that's one of the questions I often ask when I see a very picky eater is, are they picky with the clothes, like the text on the shirt? the elastic band around the, on the pants, their shoes and socks and things like that. And because a lot of times what picky eaters are asked, is it a texture thing? If it's a texture thing, most parents be able to say, oh yeah, it's, he's super picky. He prefers all the crunchy food or prefers dry food. And that pickiness in the food texture always, always transfer to like texture of the shirt, clothing, socks, and also like the grounds that they walk on. So like kids who have sensory issue or sensor, sensory processing disorder tends to hate walking barefoot on grass, hate walking on sand, um, or sometimes even doesn't like going on the beach. I live in Hawaii, we'll have beach everywhere. So some of these kids will freak out when you put them at the beach and have to get sand between their toes. So those are signs of sensory processing disorder. It can be an isolated sensory disorder thing or it could be part of like um, other, other conditions. So we see very, very, very common is kids with autism. Almost 90% of kids with autism also have sensory processing disorder. So they're picky with not just like the touch, so if we think of sensory, we're thinking of the five senses. So how they look, how they look, how they smell, how it feels, so touching it with your hands in the mouth, and how things sounds when you chew the food, bite the food, and swallow it, how it sounds, and what else I'm missing? Look, taste, smell, and how food smells. So those are all the sensory five senses that we're looking at when someone is dealing with sensory processing disorder. So it could be part of the diagnosis of autism. Some kids with ADHD also have sensory processing thing. And if you think about it, with the ADHD is more the tactile sensory because kids with ADHD needs to be constantly moving. Because when they're moving, it's sending signal back to um, the body. And they also like pressure. If actually um, kids with autism, they like pressure, like that strong hug or the heavy blankets that pressure on them actually calms them down because it's, again, it's a tactile feedback. So all of that can be sensory related. Some kids are more sensitive, some are not so much. Um, but then there's also other things to look into, like especially with the taste. Um, some kids prefer very strong taste. I have two year old who prefer to eat raw onions or eat super spicy food. We often think that young kids or babies prefer blind food, not all of them. 
Um, and then like my daughter, she's super picky with her food, but I think part of it is um, there's some sensory stuff to it, and then and then there's some deficiency in in sync as well. So yeah, so all of those things can come into play, but um, that's why it's important that you get like a someone who who's a specialist and have to deal with this kind of things for a long time because like me I I can ask you all the right kind of question and pinpoint what what is the issue but for most people who don't work with kids they'll be like especially doctors they'll be like oh yeah just just starve your kid starve your kids two days they'll eat but kids with sensory issue they they don't care that they're hungry because they don't feel hungry and they have to be treated differently hungry don't bother them at all but anyway Okay, this is an interesting question, and I want to go over this. Um, just kind of mention it, not so much like how to help, but I think I think we need to as um as a community be kind of nice and understand ADHD more because a lot of the posts that I've read inside the Facebook group is a lot of fear. Like just reading the questions from the parents, I can sense a lot of the fear. In them thinking that they might be doing something wrong or the kids gonna turn out bad or because the kids have the ADHD diagnosis it's like it's like the end of the world because the kids gonna not turn out good and things like that but but part of the purpose of me creating this community is I want you to understand that it is not the end of the world having ADHD is not the end of the world just like any other disability there's always things that you can do to help to make the symptoms better or to go around those symptoms and still provide a, a, an empowering environment for your child and also help your child to reach the full potential. Because ADHD is just an obstacle, it's just symptoms, just like anything else. And um, if, if this still doesn't motivate you, one time I was at the court and I don't remember why I was at the court and I was waiting and there was this blind person walking in down the hallway into a courtroom. He has, you know, those things that people who cannot see have, right? But he also have a person next to him walking him. This guy actually was a lawyer. He was blind, like full on blind, but he was a lawyer. So if someone who is blind and and have that motivation and that drive to become a lawyer. Your child with the ADHD symptoms have so much more potential than that. So if like blindness didn't stop this person, I think you need to believe that ADHD doesn't stop, it's not gonna stop your child. And I know that right now it sounds like it's really scary because you, you're getting all this pressure from the school and then the other thing too is you also need to look into is the is this school the best environment for your child? And I understand not everyone can afford homeschooling or private school, but it is something that I think we need to think about as a whole whole US or whole population. Is is the child is the school system today still benefit our children? Because technology have changed so much in the last 30 40 years and the way we function we live our life and how we do business nowadays have changed so much but the school system is still the same we're basically the school system is like little factory of factory of um factory of factory workers treating our kids like a like a dough but we're trying to shape our kids into someone who doesn't question doesn't speak up and look up to authority and not question anything. And I think we need to, to be as a parent for our child interest is ask the better question, like is my, does my child really need to sit there for three hours and not talk at all? Like I remember growing up, I grew up in a Catholic school. So it's even worse because the nuns are mean, like serious, like the nuns are mean, especially this one will have a special name for her. But I get punished all the time for little things like just talking, asking my friends questions and things like that. Every time I turn I utter a word, I get punished. Like, is that really necessary? When every time your child speak up or try to talk or ask something, 
something, they get punished. You teaching your child that it's not, it's not right to speak up. Then you create a population of kids and adults who don't speak up. Everyone just go around being bullied, being pushed maximum at work. Like keep pushing more work on you, and you never speak up because that's what you, you're taught growing up. Don't speak up. Whatever adults or authority figure tell you do something, you just do it. But I think that's wrong. We need to teach our kids to be, to be more, to be more confident and speak up. And I think that will also help with the ADHD symptoms. Rather than focusing on the ADHD symptoms as something bad, and keep reminding our kids that hey, you have ADHD, you can't focus, you can't remember because you have ADHD. You're giving your child an excuse now. You're not helping just because you think that you're reminding them is not helping. You're just reminding them that they're different and something is wrong with them, rather than telling them that. They're not good at focusing. They're not good at memories. They forget stuff all the time. It's reminding the good things because every kids have something good in them. Like my daughter, she's not a good writer. She, she's not always focused. But I, I always emphasize that hey, you're really good in math and science. Those are your strengths. So let's focus on those. And you're not such a great writer, and you can't really remember stuff all the time. Maybe let's find some ways to write down all the things you need to do. So you try to help them cope with it, rather than like reminding them of the shortcoming, and that's very damaging to the to the confidence and self esteem. Because our job as a parent is to protect our child and to love them, but also create an environment for them, not just the physical environment, but the emotional environment. To build the self-esteem, to help them build the confidence, because just having the ADHD diagnosis or having some of the shortcomings of not able to sit down, not able to control the the temper and things like that, doesn't make them any more different than anyone else who have other disability. We need to understand that, and again, we need to encourage our kids and make them feel that they're special in other ways, but not in their In their not so good ways. So here's so the question is, what's the one thing you wish people understood about ADHD kids? So one person says, is how incredibly smart many of them are, and I totally agree. So knowing that your kid is smart, focus on how smart they are. Praise them when they do something, something brilliant, rather than like every time they they forget something like. Oh, what did you forget this time again? Don't do that. When they forget something, just like、oh, okay, let's go back and get it, and just act it like nothing. You forget things too, but you don't bank up yourself and say, "Oh my God, I'm such a stupid bitch. I keep forgetting things." You don't. Everyone forget things. It's no big deal. But focus on your child's accomplishment. It's all those little praise. An accomplishment that builds the self-esteem and built the self-confidence. And when your child understands that, oh my God, I I have all these great qualities, and mom and dad is so proud of me because of my athletic achievement or other things, then the ADHD part is not so much of an issue anymore. Um, here is then the next person says, agree. I agree. A lot of street smarts. Emotional intelligence, and when they put their mind to something, they're unstoppable. Yep, totally agree. Because with the ADHD, we often think that kids with ADHD can't focus, but it's actually not true. They're just focusing on so many things at the same time. But when there's something that picks their mind, they can hyper focus on that. So we need to help our children to find what interests them and nurture that area with them. Okay, this other person says, <coughs> "I'm probably gonna go over a little bit,、um, that they aren't ADHD kids, and they're kids with ADHD, and your kids aren't broken, and language like this is deficit based." Totally agree. That's why I don't like to use the ADHD symptom or ADHD diagnosis all the time. I prefer to use the term ADHD symptoms, because. To me, the symptoms not able to focus, not able to sit still, all those are just symptoms 
a sign that something else is going on in the body or in the child's life and we need to dig deeper rather than just focusing putting a, slapping a label on and then putting a band-aid which is ADHD medication is not gonna work it just turns your child into a drug dependent having to take that medication for the rest of their life and that's one thing that I I feel the medical community kind of did a disservice to a lot of people with mental illness is that they keep telling them that your ADHD, your OCD, or your ODD, your depression, anxiety is something that is wrong with you genetically and you're going to take this medication for the rest of your life. Okay, this is going to be the last because I know it's over an, almost over an hour. But um, we often talk about genetics. Genetics is only half of the equation. I hear, I saw someone mention about the ADHD is like um, a, something inherited from both parents. There is a genetic component to it, but it is not 100% equation. The way to think of genes is genes are like the slight, slight switch on your wall, like the one I have over there, you flip it on and flip it off. So the way I explain genetics is you have a light switch you have the light, which you probably can't see, but in your house, you have a light switch, you have the light, you have electricity. So if you want to turn on the light, you move your finger and flip the switch on, the light turns on, right? But if you don't want the light to, to go on, like during the day you don't need light, you flip the switch, turn off the switch, and the light goes off. So that's how genes work. Unlike what people think, the way that I think whoever come up with this whole genetic thing totally Mis, um, misrepresent the whole situation because when people say I have the depression gene I have the fat gene I have the addiction gene it's like a life sentence once you give yourself that statement you put yourself that you're going to deal with this problem for the rest of your life and that's it then they stop finding treatment they stop, stop seeing potential they stop recognizing their health and their hope so stop using the word genetics because, like I said, it's only half, it only explains half of the equation, so it's not true. The way genes is, like I talk about the flipping on and off, your environment flips on, turns on the genes and turn off genes, just like cancer cells or cancer genes. People talk about, oh yeah, I have the cancer gene. Cancer genes, everyone have cancer in the body, something that actually every medical doctors, every medical professional should know about it because it is in our anatomy and physiology book. One of the, the function of our immune system is to kill cancer cells. So in our body, because in our body, there's all these new cells being generated constantly all the time. So, but sometimes it's not perfect. So we might make a few extra something or we might make a few mistakes and these mistakes actually turns into cancer. But we don't all develop cancer because we have a strong immune system that actually corrects this, kill the cancer, get rid of it, and we move on with our life. That's normal. That happens in every one of us every single day. So our body curing cancer is not a new thing. It's a fundamental healing properties that we all have. But the problem is when we start having these cancer cells, growing un out of control because the immune system is not working properly. So what causes it to not working properly could be the environment, something that we eat, something that we breathe in, something we drink in, some kind of stress and traumas, things that causing us to suppress our own immune system. So immune system not functioning properly, then this cancer cells that normally would have been killed is growing out of control. And this is all explained by how HIV or AIDS kill patients because their immune, immune system is so suppressed by the HIV virus that the immune system is like almost zero. So all these normally normal cancer cells that are normally dead because of our, our robust immune system start um, allow all this random cancer to grow. Because like, if you read all the structures and doctors, nurses, they should know this because that's really the physio physiology of HIV infection. 
is that all of those um, all those cancer that is um, that HIV or AIDS patient have is all these random cancer that all of us is going through all the time that our immune system kills it. But because in HIV patient, they don't have the immunity to kill, kill this cancer, so these cancers are growing. So again, it is a, not a new history in cancer research or anything. All we need in cancer treatment is to boost our immunity. That's the reason why I don't donate to cancer research because we already have that innate ability to kill cancer in our body. We just need to make sure that we're eating the right food to suppress the cancer gene and also to boost the immunity. And then going back to what I started all this out is the cancer, the, how the genes get turned on and off. The genes in our body interact with, an, with our environment. So that means that food we eat, the drinks, water we drink, the air we breathe, the interaction, social interaction, interpersonal reaction, interaction, all of those are part of our environment. All of those can affect our body function and can affect how the genes get turned and off. So our brain actually doesn't stop growing. It is still growing. This is called neuroplasticity. It's a real science. So our brain is constantly um, growing and remodeling just like any parts of our body. So when the gene is turned off by wrong kind of food, so if you eat junk food all the time, eat the wrong kind of food, the cancer genes are more likely to be turned on. To turn it back off, you have to change your diet completely to eat a super clean diet that is like minimized of all the toxins and things like that. And with the social media and all those things going on, there's a lot more cancer survivor coming up and saying, hey, I follow this specific diet and I, I actually cure cancer. So the food is part of the cancer cure. And the other part is the, is the stress. If you're constantly worrying, thinking of stress, thinking of bad things happening to you, thinking of the, the mean people in your life, then you're creating a stress in your body. When your body has all these stressful thoughts, negative thoughts, it actually... Um, activate the stress response, which is your fight flight response. So it's making all these stress hormones, cortisol, adrenaline, and all those things that, that put you at like a high alert. So when your body is in all that stress, one of the things that stress does is it suppress your immunity. So you again, your immunity being suppressed. So that means that cancer cells are more likely to, to overgrow. And also disease are more likely to enter your body because your immunity is not functioning as well. So that's kind of the genetic part. So the genetics only explain that there might be a gene in you that you are more likely, but not 100% to have certain condition. That's genetics. The actual more appropriate studies is the study of epigenetics. So epigenetics is, is the study of how the human genes interact with our environment. And this is a better explanation of the genetics and, and how we can change our genetics. Because when you eat the right food, stay away from crazy people that upsets you, have better communication with yourself, and not let bad things bother you that much, your, your immunity is going to work better and then you also combine it with better food, better conversation with yourself, then you'll notice that some of the genes not going ever, ever expressed. And, um, and the same thing, like people talk about the fat gene, and I was like, like people need to stop using that as an excuse to stay overweight. Because if you have the fat gene and I put you on an island with no food, are you still gonna stay fat? That's the question to ask. If the fat gene is really that powerful, that means that if you have a fat gene, you can stay on an island with no food and still be fat because somehow your body magically gives you all that food and, and extra calories to keep you fat, right? But no, that, that's a really good thing, something to think about. Like, does the fat gene really matter? Or is it really the food that you eat and the environment? And the other example is like, um, hair color. So in school, when we when we were learning about genetics, we talk about hair color, how it is inherited to the children, 
which kids are gonna get half white, half blonde or some blonde or whatever. So hair color is a genetics, but then, but again, as we all age, no matter what your hair color is, it all turns gray, right? And, and that again, explain the epigenetics part. So if, if the gene is so powerful, you're born with black hair, you're born with um, what other hair, blonde hair, then your hair color shouldn't change, right? If it's all genetics. But as we all age, as we stop making that, that hair pigment because of the aging process, of, of the, how the body's not making as much of those, that's an environmental change. We all have gray hair as we age when the hair pigment is not there. So again, what I'm trying to say is genetics does not explain everything and it is not it's not an excuse for not having hope. The hope is in epigenetics. Changing your environment will give you what you want. You can change your gene and your body function with changing your environment, which includes the food, the water, the air, interaction, people around you, and all of those things. So yeah, I think I'm done talking. And yeah, so that's it. And like I said, if you have any question in the future, any comments, put it in the Instagram or Facebook here. And then I'll see you all again next week. Okay, bye. Bye, you all have a good Saturday or maybe Sunday in some of your area. But have a very good day. Okay, bye.